Welcome to episode two of Taka and Takeo Explain the Japanese Economy, season two. Uh, this is Takeo Hoshi at the University of Tokyo and the Tokyo College that aims to shape a, a, shape a shared future together. I'm Takatoshi Ito at Columbia University, and uh, we have a guest, uh, Professor Toshi Arimura at Waseda University. And this is a continuation of the first episode uh, that started discussion on Japan's uh, environmental policy. And if you have not watched the first episode, please uh, uh, take a look at the YouTube, YouTube channel. And um, uh, this, this will uh, flow into this um, uh, uh, episode. So we, we ended the first episode with a discussion of carbon tax and which is a way to price carbon. And we want to dig deeper into the issue of uh, carbon pricing. And um, uh, another way, to, uh, so carbon tax or car uh, cap and trade, those are the two issues uh, that, uh, two, two choices that uh, you can choose from. So if you haven't heard about cap and trade, carbon tax and so on. Uh, there's a very nice discussion in our textbook, box box 14.1. So please take a look at the box 14.1 uh, after watching this, or, or you can read that section right now. Uh, you can stop the video and go to the textbook and read box 14.1 14 and come back to this video and enjoy the discussion. Right, and actually there's a, a figure 14.14, 14, which sets okay. the uh, uh, issue uh, quite well. So this is uh, figure 14.14 14, updated to the uh, most uh, uh, recent year, which is uh, the statistics is available. So we had, uh, th this is since 1990, the uh, greenhouse gas emission of Japan, which is reported to the international organization. And uh, you, know, you could see up and down of the uh, CO2 emission. I, I think the uh, Toshi can explain uh, uh, many details of this uh, figure, which probably we, we don't have time, but uh, Kyoto Protocol uh, was concluded in 1987 and uh, it was approved uh, in Japan. And um, uh, 2005, it came into effect. Effect means that the Japan was obliged to reduce the uh, CO2 emission. Otherwise, you get penalized in the uh, phase two. Then um, uh, the tragedy happened 10 years ago. And uh, that um, uh, increased the emission of CO2 because uh, nuclear uh, was um, uh, uh, out, out of service uh, for uh, several years after the uh, earthquake and the Fukushima accident. So, but recently, recently we, we see the uh, declining uh, trend. And is this trend enough to reduce to carbon neutral uh, by 2050, and probably not. But uh, uh, Toshi can explain uh, those um, uh, trend and, and um, how to do it, um, how to how to achieve the carbon neutrality tw by 2050. So let me ask um, Toshi to clearly explain the difference between cap and trade and uh, carbon tax. Those are two choices under the umbrella of uh, carbon pricing and um, uh, how to, how to um, uh, implement cap and trade, which Kyoto Protocol was uh, based on globally, except US and China. And um, uh, who would support, uh, what is the logic of cap and trade uh, uh, advocates? And any chance to reintroduce that in Japan? Uh, if not, then uh, we have to go to carbon tax route, I think. So uh, please, um, uh, 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 please uh, 
enlighten us on these um, uh, issues of cap, cap, uh, cap and trade versus um, uh, carbon tax. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for motivating our discussion. Uh, so there are two types of carbon pricing. Uh, one is carbon tax, the, the other is a cap and trade. And uh, actually, uh, as I explained in the uh, episode one, uh, we have a carbon tax, a certain kind of carbon tax, and the, it is often the case that government put the tax on fossil fuel uh, proportional to the content of the uh, carbon. So that is a typical way uh, of carbon tax, and I think its idea is based on the Peruvian tax. And the, the second type of uh, carbon pricing is cap and trade. And in the cap and trade, uh, the idea is basically using the, the market to solve the environmental issues or climate change issues. So the regulators set the total amount of the uh, quantity, of, uh, the um, number of the permits that the economy can have, and let the government assign that rights or uh, permits to the polluters, and then they freely trade. And if they reduce more than their permits given, they can sell the extra. If they don't have enough, they can buy it in the uh, market. And it is true that we do not have a cap on the trade at the national level, but in Japan, we do have a, a emission trading scheme. I mean, it's another mm -hmm. name of a cap on trading scheme. In Tokyo, and its neighboring prefecture, Saitama. So both systems uh, reduced emissions successfully. And uh, those who are not familiar to the uh, Japanese map, uh, this is the map of Japan, and Tokyo is, uh, is here, and Saitama is north to the Tokyo. So only two uh, provinces, prefectures, uh, have uh, uh, ETS. And Tokyo ETS uh, started in 2010, and there are three phases, and we are now in the third phase. Uh, actually, there are four phases, and we are now in the th third phase of these systems. And the emission reduction target was 8% for the commercial sectors, and 6% for manufacturing sectors. And Saitama actually created the system uh, in collaboration with Tokyo. So they started one year late uh, after Tokyo started so in 2011. Actually, Saitama ETS is not so known, and perhaps because they started the ETS when we had this uh, earthquake in 2011, so there was not much reporting of Saitama ETS. And the uniqueness of Tokyo ETS is that uh, the main target is commercial sectors, because we do not have many manufacturing facilities inside Tokyo, so 80%, close to 80% are commercial sectors. On the other hand, uh, Saitama, uh, most of the targets are manufacturing plants. And both systems actually successfully reduced emissions uh, compared to their baseline, so 25% reduction by 2014 14 in Tokyo, and 22% for Saitama by 2014. And you can find about the details of this uh, carbon pricing uh, in the book I co-edited with Professor Shigeru Matsumoto at Aoyama Gakuin. Uh, uh, the title is Carbon Pricing in Japan, and it's an open access book. So it's an open access book, so everybody can uh, read that. So, so it's, it's, it's very interesting. I didn't know this, uh, not, not, not even the one in Tokyo. So this uh, trading, tra trade, uh, emission trading system, so how active is the market? Is uh, the emission right is traded, right? What kind of prices and uh, transaction volumes are we looking at in these markets? Uh, that's a good question. Actually, uh, the tr the number of the trades is not so uh, the, the trading is not so active. Well, uh, first of all, there is no uh, place for the financial sectors. Hmm. Uh, 
well, when the Tokyo government uh, and site was discussing uh, emission trading schemes, the national government was also discussing the Tokyo ETS. Uh, I'm sorry, the emission trading schemes. But the industry sectors was opposing to the cap and trade, saying that this will lead to a money game. By money game, they mean that, well, uh, people will uh, buy permits and make money for not contributing the environmental outcomes, and it may lead to the bubble of the permits. And that was a kind of, uh, I think, uh, accepted to the Japanese stakeholders then. So the Tokyo government decided to exclude the financial sectors from the market. So there is no uh, auctions, and all the tradings are bilateral. So financial institutions are prohibited from uh, joining this market, the buying and selling in this market. Right. Hmm. Can I show you the next slide then? Uh, yes, please. So in the phase run, uh, actually, 90% of the entities reduced their own, uh, own emissions and achieved the target. And only 9% uh, obtained additional permits. And the price was initially very high, uh, like uh, $100, close to $100 per ton. But uh, as I mentioned, that uh, the most of the entities reduced more than they uh, necessary, so the permits price went down, and it closed to like fifteen dollars per ton. And the number of the trades are limited, so that's the uh, actually unique feature of Tokyo ETS. In the uh, other cap and trade schemes, actually the financial institution. Uh, play more important roles in you know promoting the trades of the permits. I remember that uh, uh, the uh, emission trade in Europe also had uh, price volatility, and when the COVID hit, of course, all the activities went. Uh, uh, quiet and and the price uh, plummeted and uh, so I, I think the you know volatility of the price would be a uh, substantial obstacle uh, and um, wh whether whether um, inviting uh, financial institutions or um, speculators um, uh, would help or uh, or hurt, or hurt the uh, volatility. That's uh, that's a good uh, theoretical and empirical question, I suppose. And also, the falling price seems to suggest there's an excess supply of permits, right? Right. right. So, so, so they can restrict the amount of permits, uh, reduce the pollution, and increase the price. Right. right. Yes, but uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, four phases in the Tokyo ETS, and the emission reduction target becomes more and more tight in the later phases. And I know that uh, lots of entities are now uh, facing the difficulties achieving the target on their own. So I suspect that lots of entities now uh, will rely on the additional allowances in the phase three or phase four. So I, 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 I guess, I believe that the financial institution can play an important role in the phase three or phase four. And so I don't know if the Tokyo government accept this idea, but I think it's one way, one direction that we can develop in facing this uh, more stringent emission target in phase three or phase four. Okay, so, but um, this is only two prefectures in, in entire Japan and um, uh, the steel and um, uh, power generations uh, usually um, happen outside Tokyo. 
So um, um, I, would, I would say that impact, overall impact of this, this Tokyo Saitama uh, trading scheme uh, is uh, very minor uh, for the national level. And um, um, I, I think there is a strong resistance uh, among the um, um, manufacturing industries, uh, especially uh, uh, steel making. So recently, uh, it was reported in the media that uh, CEO of Nippon Steel uh, said that taxing CO2 emission, you must be joking. And that this was widely quoted and to show that um, uh, the resistance, but you know, um, uh, uh, a few weeks later that uh, uh, there was another report that Nippon Steel has um, uh, announced its commitment to go carbon neutral by 2050. So there seems to be a uh, change of the heart and uh, that's good, good uh, development, I, I would say. So, um, but how can we, you know, the persuade the industry that um, uh, carbon pricing is uh, a good thing uh, for the economy and for the world, of course. And uh, one way to a, uh, persuade the uh, industries, I think, is uh, to design the grandfathering of emission either by quota in case of a cap and trade uh, or sort of lump sum, uh, uh, lump sum rebate of um, uh, carbon tax to ease the transition, you know, transition by well, for over 20 years or th uh, 30 years. And um, uh, so you have to design the, uh, you have to design this um, uh, carbon pricing and certain form of grandfathering the uh, status quo uh, industries uh, emissions. And uh, do, do you have any good idea or good examples in the world of the grandfathering of the industries to make them, uh, uh, you know, make them to um, support the cause of carbon pricing. Well, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, before answering to your questions, uh, I would like to go back to the map of Japan, because. Uh, Taka was mentioning the place location of the uh, steel mills mm -hmm. and power plants. Uh, yes, actually, I think when Tokyo implemented this ETS, they, they were expecting that Kanagawa and Chiba, the neighboring uh, prefectures, joining because that's what happened when the Tokyo government introduced uh, air pollution regulation toward diesel trucks in 2004, mm -hmm. around 2004. Uh, the governor Ishihara introduced the, some regulation on diesel trucks and all three provinces, uh, prefectures, joined this effort. But when they discussed the cap and trade for CO2, Yokohama or Kanagawa or Chiba did not uh, participate. And as Taka mentioned, there are steel mills and power plants on the bay. And also Kawasaki and Yokohama, they have steel mills and uh, power plants. So I think there was a political difficulty <laughs> to follow the Tokyo's uh, effort to adapt cap and trade. So that was like, uh, I think, uh, my response to the uh, first part of your <laughs> remarks. And Coming back to the uh, how to involve the steel sectors, and I have been involved in discussion of carbon pricing in uh, since around 2009, and in 2010 they had a under the Ministry of the Environment under the Democratic Party of Japan, we had a discussion on emission trading schemes, 
and well, there are lots of things were happening under that administrations, uh, but the we had a serious discussion on emission trading schemes, and we proposed committee also proposed uh, grandfathering to introduce when we are uh, adapting cap and trade. But the, I think at that time the steel sector was not accepting the like a cap itself or regulation itself. But uh, n well now as Sako mentioned that the steel sectors, uh, well, some uh, Nippon Steel are uh, like accepting this zero emissions by 2050. So I don't know. Uh, someday they may accept carbon pricing. <laughs> well, I mean last week uh, I had a discussion. I was in. I was attending the uh, committee under METI and committee under Ministry of the Environment and discussing carbon pricing. And at this stage, they still do not agree <laughs> to the idea. So in in that committee, you may be talking about this, but I hear, I, I've heard that Suga government has now uh, started talking about carbon pricing that enhances economic growth. Is there such a carbon pricing mechanism that directly contributes to economic growth? Well, uh, thank you for your questions. Well, I think there are lots of ways to ease the burden of energy intensive sectors. And grandfathering, as Taka mentioned, is the most popular way to ease the burden of energy intensive sectors. So in that sense, I think it's it's helping the yeah. economy, <laughs> and uh, like uh, I heard that like a steel sector in Germany, they initially opposed to this ETS, but now ETS has been in, uh, imposed in EU for more than fifty year, fifteen years, and now steel sector says that ETS is important because it's, it will help them to do a R and D for hydrogen. So I think that's certainly true that grandfathering is effective. Hmm. But the another way that carbon uh, tax can contribute to the uh, economic growth I, I I recently did study on the uh, double dividend of uh, carbon pricing. Okay, I guess we want to explain what double dividend of uh, carbon taxation means to the audience. Okay. So yes. the, there there are two dividends, right, of of carbon tax. Well, two benefits right. of carbon taxing. What well, one is a tax revenue and also a reduction of pollution or the good for environment as well. Is that the meaning of a double dividend? Uh, I, I, am I explaining that correctly? Can I share you my slide yes, again? Please. So the first dividend is that when we put the carbon price, we will change the price ratios and that will uh, promote renewable energy or energy saving or new technology innovation and that will help the decarbonization of economy but at the same time we will receive the, the government receive the carbon tax revenue and if we uh, use this tax revenue to reduce existing distorting tax like for example corporate tax le so if we reduce the corporate tax using the ta carbon tax revenue that may increase the investment and that will may lead the increase in the GDP, uh, it, which is we call second dividend. So reducing the carbon emissions, there will be a cost. But if we use a tax revenue wisely, we may help the economy to grow. And with Professor Takeda, Shiro Takeda at Kyoto Sangyo Universities, we simulated a dynamic uh, CG model, and this was actually this research I, we started before the announcement of carbon neutrality. So we are aiming f for the 80% reduction in 2050, which was the target under the Abe administration. And 
uh, here we are showing the results of the GDP and the income and we have uh, tried uh, four scenarios so after carbon tax we just return the money to the economy as like a lump sum tax reductions or we use it for the income tax reductions or we use the revenue for corporate tax reduction or we use it for consumption tax reductions and in our simulation uh, we find that actually the uh, corporate tax reduction can help the GDP increase in 2030 and that may lead to the increase of GDP by 1% and also consumption tax is also uh, may, uh, may be effective in helping the economy so we found uh, some strong uh, evidence to support the idea of uh, this uh, carbon pricing to help economic growth <laughs> So this is this is our recent publications. So if the government uses a tax increase to retire some debt, because the uh, Japanese government has been running deficit and it has uh, lots of government debt, uh, what happens? Is that the same as a lump sum tax reduction here? No, uh, we. This is like a very. Uh, uh, very neoclassical model that we're using so we don't have a uh, actually national I mean the government market of the government debt and actually yeah professor Doi at the Keio University he promotes the idea that we should use the carbon tax revenue to pay the debt mm -hmm. but we cannot simulate that so we cannot compare okay. that scenario to this scenario. Maybe we should invite uh, Professor Doi next time to discuss this. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I, I think the, uh, there is um, um, maybe third dividend. Um, that is the uh, resources uh, which will be uh, dedicated to innovation, right? So we right. need innovation. We subsidize innovation or put some carrots, carrot and stick um, uh, mechanism uh, to promote the R&D for innovation. And that you know, attracts the people and capital uh, and um, uh, that that may contribute to economic growth. And uh, I, I think the example is um, going, you know, going back all the way to 1973 uh, when the first oil crisis happened, and also pollution was a you know, problem uh, in in uh, big cities. In Japan, and and there was a you know discussions that uh, those environmental uh, you know pollution uh, uh, preventive um, uh, regulations would uh, reduce the growth, or there, there was some minority opinion that may actually increase the growth because you need to invest in the pollution preventive. Um, uh, uh, technologies and that, you know, produce some byproducts and so on, uh, which is uh, stimulating for the, the, there are spillover, technological spillover to other sectors too. So maybe uh, that is possible that technological advance needs the uh, resources and uh, which may promote uh, the growth and also spillovers to other sectors could be possible. I, I don't know if this is a theory, but um, uh, do you think uh, how, how likely that uh, this uh, innovations or the recent R&D for the innovations could contribute to economic growth? Well, I, I think so. I, I think let me clarify that. Uh, I think it's very true that R&D is the first well, technology diffusion is the uh, kind of the first priority 
of the use of carbon tax revenue in Japan. And that's how it is designed so far. And I, I believe that that would be a very good uh, uh, way to use uh, carbon tax revenue. But I think if we are aiming for the uh, carbon, uh, carbon neutrality, that there will be a lot of uh, carbon tax revenue. And if the size is really getting big, I think we have to consider the other ways of using that tax revenue. And I think using the, I mean, if we reach to a certain point, using that uh, revenue to for general accounting, not go directly going for the uh, energy specific uh, accounting is a smart way to look at it. And given the, and as Taka mentioned that in 1980s, Japan had a very good experience that industries invested in energy efficiency and improved the uh, environmental uh, qualities and also led to the economic growth and I hope that uh, we can do it again using this uh, Japanese uh, private sector's uh, potential of technologies so, so that's well, what well, well Toshi th thank you very much for the discussion and we have certainly learned a lot and we hope to include some of these discussions in the third edition of our book, of, of the textbook. And uh, I hope the audience has also learned a lot about the environment and the energy, energy policy in Japan. Now we end the discussion on the environmental policy. And in the episode three and four, which follows this, we will move to uh, labor market issues in Japan. So we ho hope to see you all here at the Tokyo College channel again. And for now, uh, goodbye. Uh, thank you, Toshi. Thank you, Taka. Cool. Thank, you. thank you for having me. It was a great pleasure.